picture here in Cohen's book. And I have shown some of you this before. And this is one corner. So you're looking at about a quarter of the carpet there. Now you might need to come up and see it during the break. But you can see that it's incredibly complex. It has five borders and guards. Five. Most carpets have one or two. All right, and it's got uh, not only the elks and the horsemen, and this is, this is the funeral ceremony around here. And I mean, imagine how difficult it would have been to knot that design. These are actually beautifully uh, designed and woven horses uh, with, the, uh, with their heads bowed because it is a funeral ceremony. Then you've got another design here. Then you've got the elks and they were um, the funereal creatures. And then you've got this sort of grid pattern in the middle and it looks for all the world like tiles perhaps mosaic tiles or terracotta tiles with inlay turquoise and so on. You'll notice I'm wearing turquoise today. Um, that, that look maybe that, like they were on a palace floor. Well, guess what? They are. They're on a palace floor hundreds of miles away. And they are almost an exact representation of a Persian palace floor. So there must have been some sort of crossover there, which is intriguing. We just don't know enough to be able to say very much more than that but we do know that there's some sort of connection there. But it was obviously a really interesting thing to have been preserved because it does show that in carpets you get a whole story there. If only we knew the whole story, wouldn't that be great? But it is a story, a fusion of possibly, um, possibly sun motifs are in there. Let me give you the whole panoply of what I found. Uh, from Ur-Artian uh, sun motifs, or possibly, you'll notice some of those um, if you saw them closely enough, the tiles looked like they had a cruciform pattern there with a bud in the middle. That was very common. That's typical of Phrygian floor tiles. Now, Phrygia is a part of, of, of northern modern day Turkey, a very rich part of, uh, of, of uh, nearby Lydia, which was also a fabled, uh, wealthy area. Also, you've got beaded medallions. These are distinctively Persian uh, around the border, and you've got Griffins, these, you know, mythical beasts, but these are doubly mythical and divine because they're winged griffins. Uh, then you've got that whole uh, Scythian idea of mythical animals like um, the, the ibex and the griffin and the elks. You've got the horses and you've even got uh, some aspects which appear to be Armenian in origin. The, the experts have a field day disagreeing about this particular car, but I have to let you uh, know. And that is partly because it's about all we have for the next thousand years of carpet making. We have stories of famous carpets, and I'll tell you those, but we basically have no substantial fragments from which we can draw any extrapolations apart from this for about another thousand years. Isn't that amazing? Because they're perishable, you know? They get used. The thing about Persian carpets, even the most beautiful ones, is that they use them. They walk on them. I think it's wonderful, the idea of walking on, on a work of art, appreciating as a work of art, as a unique thing, and loving the beauty, um, and yet using it as well. To me, that honours the, the object. I'm sorry, this is how I feel about art. Okay, um, so, you know, where did it develop? Where did carpet making or, uh, originate? Look, probably in several different spots. A bit like noodles. You know, people argue about who invented pasta, who invented spaghetti, you know, did it come from China with Marco Polo? Look, different cultures, it's not such the most, the, the most amazing thing to think about rolling a bit of dough and dipping it into some soup. That's fairly obvious to me, and I'm sure they all came up with it. We can prove that the Chinese did it as early as 4000 BC, but I think carpets are, may well have developed in different areas. As long as they had the flocks, as long as they had the fibre, as long as they had the wool, as long as they needed something on the floor covering that was a bit more sophisticated than just a fleece. So um, I wouldn't be surprised, but it would appear that there was some sort of wonderful uh, interaction, a sort of a catalyst when the Scythians and the Persians got together and uh, came up with something we think like that. Uh, possibly Persia, Persia's role in this was that it by now, by the 5th century BC, was starting to become very sophisticated, very urban. Remember, they had originally been like the Scythians, known the tribal nomads, and they were now very sophisticated, very wealthy, very complex um, civilization that loved to incorporate the sophistication of its member nations. So the sophistication of Egypt, the sophistication of Babylonia, the sophistication of the Indians, the sophistication of the Scythians indeed. And they may have been the ones that were able to bring those things together such that the Persian carpet as we know it today became this wonderful thing in its own right. 
I, I think I probably can attribute that to ancient Persia. But what they did, of course, was incorporate other influences. Now, as we go towards the end of the Achaemenid dynasty, which is what we're looking at, but we're also in this course looking at the future after that as well, we will realise that there will be increasing influence from as far away as China, across the proto uh, Silk Road, or and then subsequently the Silk Road itself. So not only the silk itself, but also the designs, particularly the designs of flowers. So floral designs come in around about the same time that roses and camellias come in from China and are cultivated particularly well by the Persians for their enormous trade, which of course flowed into Europe and influenced us with our love of roses and so on today. So what they started to do was particularly incorporating uh, the rose pattern, any sort of stylized flower, but particularly roses called gules um, from China, and, uh, but also keeping some of their tribal traditions as well with um, you know, the, the very um, stylized animals and so on. Um, what we do have, as I say, is very little to go on. We do have some stone inscriptions, we do have some fragments, we do have a story about one of the great carpets of all times, which is the Khosrau carpet, from uh, around about 531 to 579 AD. Can you see that's a thousand years on? And this was during another glorious Persian dynasty, the Sasanid dynasty, the one that was knocked over by the Muslim conquest when it came through in 642 AD. Okay, but the, the, um, that dynasty was very glorious and very wealthy and this, there was this fable carpet which I'll talk about a little bit later. Let's stay back in ancient times. By the way, go and look at, you know, any books on carpets are worth looking at. I can particularly rec uh, recommend one by uh, Jacques Antiqui, uh, which is called Carpets, Techniques, Traditions and History. And you can see from that title that's everything we might want to know. Carpets, Techniques, Traditions and History. And I think I might have also mentioned that if you're interested in carpets as an investment, there is a great one by Coral Sawan, can't remember her second name, that is called Rugs to Riches. Not Rags to Riches, but Rugs to Riches. You'll be able to remember that one as well. And that will give you an investment profile. But what we've got is the idea of carpets being um, an integral part of life and in fact being the canvases. If you think about it, they didn't do oil paintings and acrylic paintings and watercolours in those days. Where did they put their art? What was their canvas? It was the carpet. And so it conveyed not only art but also concepts and ideas throughout the known world. And in fact, again Maurice Cohen has a beautiful thing where he, he pays a debt, in fact, to the traders who carried that trade and who carried that culture by selling the carpets. And uh, so he says, I would love to earn the respect of those generations of merchants, masters without knowing it, whose efforts, although they had neither the time nor the audacity to believe themselves popularizers, have broken down cultural barriers that stood firmly for centuries. These were the great middlemen carrying all sorts of cultural ideas through their carpets and through their impetus to continue trading what was a luxury good. You know, I love talking, my whole aim is to talk about luxury goods, partly because I think they've been ignored when one talks about history, food and luxury goods. People tend to talk about the war states and monarchs, but also because it's luxury goods that pushes trade. Not ordinary goods, but luxury goods. And that trade is what has bonded people together so that the history of the world is not just wars. Wars are about 10%, the other 90% is people getting on with each other in all sorts of wonderful ways. It's a good story, it's an optimistic view of the world, it's the one I'd like to stay with. All right then, so you've got that. Now let me give you some famous carpets. There is one called the Dragon and Phoenix carpet. Remember I said these two are very Zoroastrian, they represent, well you, you're tempted to think that it's a rather Chinese concept, and it does show a bit of trickle, doesn't it, from China. Um, but certainly two animals, very similar in that they're mythical and magical, but different in their own ways, the phoenix being sort of bird-like. Um, now, this particular carpet's 15th century, so 1400s. It's Turkish and Anatolian, but the design, as I say, comes from China. So that shows a lovely fusion happening there conflict of, of opposites and of good and, of, and evil. I don't have a picture of that per se, but what I do have is uh, a picture of, let me see, of the Ardeville carpet. This is another very famous carpet, and I think I've got it, yes, okay. Has anybody heard of the Ardeville carpet? I'll, I'll go for the two most important ones. This 
It's so fine, you won't be able to see it from there. You'll have to come up during the break and see it. But isn't that fine? That is 16th century, 16th century, it is silk. And this is the fine design you can get when you do silk. You'll notice that it's a very complex medallion and then the medallion has a sort of supernova effect around it. But look at the arabesques, look at the fine floral designs. The lovely, the fact that the, the background is black, is, the field is black, this is very interesting indeed. This is the one I think of the most beautiful carpets in the world. It's so called the Ardeville because it was found near Ardeville. It was probably a moss carpet. It was one of two. They often wove carpets in pet. Can you another one? Imagine another one. Now we, we sort of lost sight of the second one, but we know that there originally were two. Because often there were two looms. If they were doing a large piece, a master weaver would take charge of that and would sit in the middle and dictate to the to the two loom people. Uh, exactly what to do, what colours to use, what not to do next. Isn't that amazing? It was all in his head. And there'd be two looms, which is why these things were often done in pairs. And there was a certain significance about doing things in pairs anyway. They were often termed the male and the female uh, complementarity of those two. Swords were often forged in pairs so that there would be a, a male and a female, a, a, a masculine and a feminine version thereof. And so they often, for practical reasons, but also symbolic reasons, they often did this was one that was found in a mosque in Ardeville. And the great thing about this is that it's in the Victoria and Albert Museum in England. Another picture. Just <laughs> wow. The, the effect of my talks. <laughs> Explosive. <laughs> Isn't that great? Okay. Oh dear. Things come in three, so we'll wait for the next one. <laughs> so this beautiful carpet. Um, is in the Victoria and Albert Museum under the auspices of William Morris. Now, if you remember William Morris in the, I think, late 18th, early 19th century, uh, was the great man who revived the interest in folk um, art and all sorts of cultural uh, craft practices. And uh, so he persuaded the government to buy this and jolly good show too. So there it is. Um, I'll, I'll just show you that picture because I think you need to have as many pictures as you can in your mind uh, as I talk about these. So there are some famous carpets, you know, which have interesting stories attached. I guess this is my point here. So um, as you, you know, approach any carpet, realise that every carpet has got a story. It's got the story of, you know, the people who were involved in actually just making that carpet. And it's probably time I give you a little uh, quote here. Um, where you talk about uh, the people who uh, are involved in doing that sort of thing. Uh, lovely book that I think you should read about the uh, carpets and the dyes, and I recommended it before, is The Root of Wild Matter by um, Cohen, no, not Cohen, by Brian Murphy, uh, Irish uh, journalist. And here's a little quote. He says, uh, The difference is like a perfectly tended garden and the wild beauty of nature or the desert. Really, I see it that way. This is his friend telling him about carpets. The nomad weavers are doing the weaving for themselves from their own heart and mind. So it's going to represent their background. It may not be technically perfect, like from some expert weavers, but that doesn't matter. It's pure and real. You don't judge beauty by how tight the knots are or if the wefts are perfectly straight. Beauty is sincerity. You can tell the difference, he says, between the hug of a real friend and someone who doesn't care about you. That's what I'm talking about. So you see, even if you don't understand the significance of what you're looking at in the carpet, you've got to realise that there are people who made that carpet who really cared about it. And for them it was, you know, nursed from the very beginnings, from, the, from growing the plant that provided the dye to dye the wool and so on and so forth. Keep some of that in your mind. What I'm going to do today is try and give